I'm going to invite you to take your Bibles or your Bible apps and turn to a couple of uh, different passages uh, that we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, if you will, find uh, John chapter 3 and then put your finger there and then find Romans chapter 1. If uh, you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the pews around you. They look just like this one. And uh, turn to page 1130. Uh, you will find John chapter 3. And by the way, if you need a Bible, you, you want to read the Word of God, you don't have one, then take one of these with you. This is our gift to you because uh, we know if you read it, it'll change your life. Uh, we're wrapping up our series called The Core today. We've been looking at the essential uh, beliefs, the core values uh, of Calvary, to, in part to remind those who are part of Calvary what we're all about. And then secondly, if you're new to Calvary, we want to inform you. We want to teach you, share with you who we are and what we're all about. We don't play games here. We don't try to hide here. So we just kind of put it on the table and uh, hope that that's what you like. Uh, and if not, then you can run for the door. Uh, we're fine with that too. So we're concluding the series talking about uh, our essential beliefs, the last two that we're discussing in the series. But I want to start off by telling you a story that's found in the Gospel of John chapter 8, one that no doubt many of you are familiar with. It goes like this. Uh, Jesus got up in the morning and he went into Jerusalem and he began to, to teach at the temple. And of course, a crowd gathered around him, people who wanted to hear Jesus teaching. And while he was uh, teaching the crowd, a group of religious leaders, scribes and Pharisees, came pushing through the crowd, angrily, loudly uh, disrupting the teaching time until they were right in front of Jesus. And then they put a woman right in front of Jesus and they said this, teacher. By the way, when the scribes and Pharisees use the word teacher for Jesus, that's what taking God's name in vain is. They, they didn't mean it. They weren't trying to honor him in any way. In fact, they hated him. But, but they still used it in a, in a very uh, sarcastic way. Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commands us to stone such women as these. What do you say we should do with her? Now, this question wasn't an honest question. They just wanted to trap Jesus, and they thought they'd come up with the perfect scenario, the perfect way uh, of exposing him. Uh, because they, they thought, well, if he says stone her, because that's what the law says, then all the crowds are going to know that Jesus is really just like us, and he's going to lose the people. Or, even better, if he says, let this woman go, then he's going to violate the law of Moses, and we'll have reasons to accuse him, and we can even condemn him to death. They thought they had their evil, perfect plan all worked up. And so uh, Jesus surprised them. Now, before I tell you what Jesus did, uh, here's my thing. It, it's, it, you know, if I were Jesus, and it's a good thing I'm not, uh, but if I were Jesus, I would have just immediately asked a question right back, like, where's the dude? Because <laughs> the last time I checked, it takes two people to commit the act of adultery. You know, and, uh, and in fact, the law of Moses says in Leviticus 20.10, if a man and woman commit the act of adultery, they are to be stoned. They, it's a plural, it's a them, both of them are included in this. And so I would have, if I were Jesus, I just would say, hey, where's the dude? Because it takes two and you guys are, you guys are being hypocritical and bringing one of the two when Moses was really clear. You, so I just would have called them on it. But Jesus is much wiser than me. And, and so what he did was he just sat down and doodled in the dirt with his finger. Just let them stew. And, of course, they didn't want to wait. They kept demanding, Jesus, answer us, answer us, give us an answer to this, this situation. And, uh, and Jesus did when he was ready to give an answer. Which, just a little aside, are you like me and you ever get kind of impatient wanting God to answer something? And you kind of demand a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And he doesn't feel obligated to answer you until he's ready. Just know who you're like if that's your case. But anyway, so they continue to, to keep you know, harassing Jesus. And finally, he, he stands up and he simply says this. Let the one of you who is without any sin cast the first stone at her. And then he sat back down and played in the dirt some more. 
And Scripture tells us that one by one, beginning with the oldest and moving to the youngest, the religious leaders left. Because even those pompous, arrogant, self-righteous uh, Pharisees and scribes knew that they were not completely guiltless. Even they couldn't pull that one off. Even they couldn't pretend to that level. So they left. And it's just Jesus and this woman and the crowd of people who came to hear Jesus teach. And they never expected they would have a lesson like this. And so Jesus says to her, woman, has no one condemned you? She says, no one, sir. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Now just pause right there. I, I think that might be the sweetest words spoken from our Savior to any one individual that he ever ministered to. Neither do I condemn you. Because he was the one who was qualified to reach down and pick up a rock and begin the process of condemnation. Because he was without sin. And he's the judge. He's absolutely righteous. And yet, instead of casting condemnation at her, he says, neither do I condemn you. Wow. Not what she was expecting. And then he says, go and leave your life of sin. Go and value yourself the way that God values you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. You're made in his image. Stop giving yourself away to people who don't care about you. Value who you are. Live your life differently. Live a changed life. Live a redeemed life. Now, that is a beautiful story. Amazing story. One that I, I hope you'll, you'll think about throughout the week. And, and I want to ask you a question. I don't want you to answer it out loud. I want you to think about this and, and ponder this. Who do you most relate to in the story? If you have to identify one of those people that you're like in the story, who would that be? And, and let me just give you a hint. It's not Jesus. Okay? <laughs> okay, if you're, looking at, if you're listening to the story and you go, well, I think I'm like Jesus. Let me, like, we need to talk later on. Because uh, he's Jesus. We're not. But really, are, are you living your life more like the Pharisees with their harsh, condemning, angry, self-righteous uh, kind of approach to life? Are, are you quick to uh, point out other people's faults while you overlook your own mistakes and sins and issues? Or are you more like this woman caught in the act of adultery? Are you living your life full of guilt and shame? Uh, are you, do you feel exposed and embarrassed? Do you feel like there's nowhere to hide? And, and you keep expecting the pain of judgment and, and disgrace to fall on you at any moment. See, while you're pondering, uh, I'm going to answer for me. Because I was raised to be like the Pharisees. I, I was raised uh, in, a, in a world where I was surrounded by people who were always talking about their sin and those people and, and how other people were messing up and, and yet never really focusing on our sin, on our issues. In fact, we spent a lot of energy trying to cover up our issues. We don't want people to know how weak we were or how much, it fail, uh, how much we failed in life uh, because then we would be condemned. But it did not take me long in my adult life to figure out that I'm like this woman caught in adultery. I'm a sinner. And I'm exposed. I, I struggle constantly with pride, with sloth, with lust, with gluttony. Oh, don't we love gluttony. I know I do. I celebrated it on Thursday, didn't you guys? <laughs> I know we call it Thanksgiving, but it's really just kind of a, hey, we're all going to overeat. Let's do it together and have a good time. Yeah, you know, I, I just confess, I can waste time playing stupid online war games. Uh, I'm guilty of sarcasm. I can be irreverent. Yes, I can be irreverent. <laughs> and I can be juvenile. I, I'll just admit that. I can be selfish and indulgent and casually destroy people with my words. I have a problem. And so do you. Because our fourth 
essential belief here at Calvary is that all people are sinners and need the grace of God. All people are sinners and need the grace of God. Uh, by the way, our world is not fond of the word sin right now. You know, we don't like to use it in public. So let me just give you a real simple uh, definition that kind of fits. Sin is when we leave God's path. God has a path. We take another route. And uh, that's sin. I take my path instead of God's. Um, it kind of looks like this. How many of you have a GPS on your car or on your phone? Okay, a lot of hands go up. How many actually use it? Okay. How many of you have ever gotten bad directions from your GPS? <laughs> yeah, isn't that the most fun? We were driving back from California one time, uh, and we decided to come back through Ehrenberg uh, and go up on that road through the res uh, into Parker. And the, the, this is the first time we used GPS, and it helped us get out of, of Southern California and avoid some traffic and things. That was great. But when we, uh, when, when we took that road, that GPS did not know that road existed. And so for like 40 miles, it kept saying, at the earliest convenience, do a U-turn and go back. <laughs> and I promise you, we just left it on to see how long it would do this. It kept doing it. And I kept hearing it get angrier and angrier <laughs> until I think at the end, it was like my mom saying, young man, turn this vehicle around and go home right now. <laughs> now, now, here's the reality. We can laugh about GPS and having wrong directions, but the Bible is God's GPS for our lives. And it's never wrong. It's never wrong. In fact, our first essential belief is that we believe the Bible is the inerrant, inspired word of God that tells us what to believe and how to live. And so when we ignore God's direction for our life, that constitutes sin. So if you've ever been selfish, you qualify. If you've ever been angry and lost your temper or ever been impatient, or held a grudge, that's sin. If you've ever lied or slandered or gossiped or taken something that wasn't yours, if you've ever eaten too much, well, we already confessed to that. If you've ever drank too much or used a mind-altering substance, have you disrespected or disobeyed your parents? Have you ever thought you were better than someone else? Even in the good way, Right? You walk by a bum, you walk by people who want to drag you down to the dirt, and you go, oh, we're better than that. Yeah, that's sin. If you've ever been jealous or envious or greedy, then you qualify. And that's the problem. So let's talk about the problem. Problem of sin. Uh, here's what Scripture says, and I'm going to share a whole bunch of verses today. I hope you'll go back and look them up and reread them and, and think about them. Romans 3.10 says that there is, as is written, none is righteous, no, not one. None of us are righteous. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Period. All. How about Romans 6.23, first half of the verse, for the wages of sin is death. You see, we are sinners and we are deserving of judgment, death, and hell. Because we have left God's path we have invited that into our lives. Just as the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, who was thrown before Jesus, deserved death. That was the sentence. She was guilty. We're guilty of being sinners. And we are by ourselves incapable of altering or escaping this reality, no matter how hard we try. That's the bad news. All of us are sinners. The good news is that there is a solution. Let's talk about the solution. Again, Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. It's the gift of God. See, God provides a solution to our sin problem. He sent Jesus into this world to be our substitute, to be our Savior. In other words, when he died, he paid the price for your sins and my sins so that he could give us forgiveness, mercy, grace. That's the beauty of grace. Now, you see, we're all sinners, which means we're all in the same boat. We all have the same problem. And it doesn't matter if you're a good person or a bad person. 
as defined by society. It doesn't matter if you're a religious person or an irreligious person. It doesn't matter if you do good deeds or bad deeds. It doesn't matter if you're a pastor. We all have the same problem. We are sinners, and we desperately need the grace of God. Good news is it's available. That leads us to our final essential belief. We believe that salvation is only through faith in Jesus Christ. Salvation is only through faith in Jesus. Uh, again, a lot of verses. You know a lot of these. John three sixteen. You, if you watch any football games, I was watching yesterday and kick an extra point. Somebody's in the middle of the end zone holding up John three sixteen. Thought that's cool. I wonder if anybody goes. I got to read that. Well, here's what it says. In case you don't know, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. Acts 16, 31, when uh, a man asked Paul how to be saved, he said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. How about Romans 10, 9? If we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You see, we believe this and live it out at Calvary. We believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And so it motivates us. It motivates us to fulfill our mission of leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus through the love of his people and the power of his truth. It motivates us to serve our community. That's why we're always inviting you to help us out as we bless Lake Havasu City because that's our strategy for leading people to Jesus. It motivates us to do missions. First of all, by supporting missions. You may or may not know this, but as a church, we give 21.5% of our budget away to mission causes beginning right here in Lake Havasu City and going to the ends of the earth. Not only that, but we send people on on missions. We support missionaries around the world, but we also invite people to go, whether it's a big trip or a small trip. Speaking of those, we've got two of them coming up in the next three weeks. Two weeks from this weekend, on Saturday, we're going up to Peach Springs to take the shoeboxes. Going to bless kids, and and anybody can go. You can take your kids. It's a low-impact trip. Going to go help cook food, serve food, play games, do crafts, uh, give out gifts. It's an awesome time. A week after that, three weeks from this weekend, a group going to Mexico. And and this is different this time because we've always gone uh, into Mexico. But there's a group that's going to go into Mexico and serve kids. And there's going to group that stay on the American side and serve kids. So you don't have to have your passport. If you want to go, check out the details are in the bulletin. But see, that we do that because we believe that Jesus, uh, salvation is only through faith in Jesus. It's why we want you to invite your friends. We've been talking about that for a while. When we're in the new building, everybody bring three friends. Let's fill that place up. And, and, and the reason is because we believe salvation is only through faith in Jesus. And when I say that, I know that makes some of you uncomfortable. Some of you it makes uncomfortable. Because in our politically correct world, you're not supposed to claim this. Right? We're supposed to value Equally, all religions the same, said no one who has faith. Uh, Let's talk about the exclusive path to salvation. Um, You know, when we talk about Jesus being the only way, let's talk about this exclusive path. And I want to make some observations. Because if this is something you struggle with, if if it's something that you kind of go, well, you know, I believe in Jesus, but I'm not sure he's the only way. Let me just give you three different areas or observations to reconsider. And and right now, I'm speaking to those who are followers of Christ. If you're not yet a follower of Christ, listen in and see if some of this doesn't make sense to you. First observation is this. It's kind of obvious, but all of the world religions believe they are the only way. All of them are exclusive. It doesn't matter if you're talking about Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam or Judaism or Christianity or even atheism. Your atheism is not a religion. Yeah, it is. It's a belief system, and people are putting their faith in that system. And every single system believes that they are the ones that is correct. If you study them, they think everybody else is wrong and they're right. All of them are exclusive. All of them. Difference about Christianity and the rest is that we actually believe that because we couldn't fix our sin problem, that God sacrificed his son to fix it for us. No other religion has that component, has a God who cares about his people that much that he's willing to lose for them. Just an observation I wanted to make that I thought was kind of obvious. Second observation I'm going to make about the exclusive path to salvation is this. It's just logic. Uh, But 
Do you believe that God created everything? I'm asking it because some of you weren't ready to answer. Do you guys believe that God created everything? Okay, most of you in here do. Not everyone does. But if you believe that God created everything, then does God have the right to decide the rules of creation? Yeah. It's kind of logical, isn't it? And, and we understand that on some levels because we talk about the natural laws that are out there. Like anybody really try to break the law of gravity? Yeah, you don't really get a vote on that one. It's going to apply to you, and you can only test it once really well. Um, you know, and the laws of physics, they exist, and science studies them and talks about them. Well, guess what? God created the world, and he made those laws, physical laws, and he also made spiritual laws, including how we could be saved. Another point of logic. Again, it's, this applies to followers of Christ. If we believe that Jesus died to provide salvation, you know, he, he paid the price for our sins in his death, then shouldn't we believe that Jesus is a necessary part of salvation? Yeah, it's kind of logical, isn't it? Third uh, observation is Scripture. Again, Scripture is not a way you're going to argue with, with people who don't know Jesus and don't follow Jesus, but this is our authority. It's God's word for us. So we're, we're going to, uh, I want you to hear what it says. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I love listening to the world talk about Jesus, and they go, ah, oh, Jesus was a great man. Jesus did this kind of stuff. He told us to love everybody. we got to love everybody. But then they ignore what Jesus actually taught. Because Jesus said, guys, I'm the way. And if you want to come to God the Father, then it has to be through me. I'm the only way. The only opportunity for you to get there is through me. Sounds a little bit exclusive. What about the apostles? Acts 4.12. The apostles are talking and they simply say, And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. No one else. That's it. Let's go back to Jesus again. John chapter 3. Uh, and, and I ask you to mark this one because I want you to read this. Again, it's a familiar passage that a lot of us stop too soon at because Jesus is answering the question of Nicodemus, a, a teacher who came to him and said, how do I have eternal life? How do I have eternal life? I, I, Jesus, I want to know this, this answer. So here's how this, this conversation ends. For God so loved the world, verse 16, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only son of God. Wow. You read that, and Jesus himself says, hey, look, if you believe in me, then those words that I spoke to that woman caught in adultery are going to echo to you for all eternity. Neither do I condemn you. But if you don't believe in me, you, you already stand condemned. I don't even have to condemn you because you're already guilty, and you're already going to suffer the, the consequences of that. You see, there is an exclusive path to salvation, and it requires placing your faith in Jesus. So while we look at the exclusive path, I also want you to see God's inclusive actions. God's inclusive actions. Because God is the one who sent Jesus to save us from our sin. To fix our problem. And God desires for people to know him and to love him. In fact, in Romans 10, 13, the Apostle Paul said, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. So you get that? There's an exclusive path, but everyone's invited. If you want in, you get in by trusting Jesus. And I know right now some of you are protesting inside. and Because one-on-one -on -one I have conversations with people and they protest verbally then. But what about the people who've never heard about Jesus? What about the people who've never heard about Jesus? <laughs> Okay, I don't do this one-on-one, -on -one, but I can do it with a group because it's easier to offend in large quantities. <laughs> I always want to say, when they say, well, what about people who never heard about Jesus? 
Oh, you mean like your neighbors? You guys realize that America as a nation is one of the most unchurched nations on the face of the earth? We have more people who don't know God in our country than all but a handful of countries in this world. Now, the reason that is, it is because we've got a lot of people. But it's also because uh, we don't, you know, kill people for not showing up at church. You know, there's just a lot of people who, who are out there living their lives, your friends and your neighbors. So uh, if you're really wondering about people who've never heard, that, that's why we want to do something about that. Um, but they usually mean people in faraway countries who live in other parts of the world where they don't have churches and they don't have, you know, uh, Christian TV stations that most of us don't watch or they don't have, uh, you know, all those avenues that we do. What about them? And... Uh, The truth is, they got answers to that question. Romans chapter 1, I want to read verses 18 and following, a pretty big chunk of passage uh, of Scripture. You may want to read this later on and and think about this. God answers the question. Now, you may not like the answer that God gives, but God answers the question. In fact, I've found that lots of times God answers my questions, and I just don't like the answers. That doesn't make them any less true. But here's what the Apostle Paul said about those people who've never heard. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Wow. You know, uh, sometimes people say the word of God doesn't really apply to today, and yet you could take that passage and lay it across our headlines of our culture and what our nation is doing, and you see it being lived out. You see, God reveals and people reject. God reveals and people reject so that they are without excuse. Now, you might say that sounds a little bit harsh, but let me tell you from my experience what, what's going on in the world. Because we support missions, we participate in missions. I've been in missions all I've done missions all over the world. And, and, and when I first started, I mean, my idea of who God was and what he could do in this world was, you know, uh, had been contained by the Baptist box, okay? You know, I've been taught this is how God works, this is what he can do, and, and then I went on mission trips and God blew the box up. Uh, so I'm just telling you, he's God, he can do whatever he wants, and, and, and I've sat on trips face-to-face with people who converted from Islam to Christianity, and, and they told me their story, and it went something like this— I had a dream, and a guy came to me, and he told me that Islam wasn't true, and I didn't know who he was, and so I left my home in Iran and and started traveling until I came across somebody who was a Christian, and they explained to me Jesus, and it all made sense, and I trusted Jesus. The other guy told me, hey, I had a, a vision, and Jesus came to me, and I knew it was Jesus, and he told me to follow him instead of Islam. And these are guys who started churches and guys who who said, I'm going back to my home country and even though I may die there, I've got to tell my friends and neighbors because Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. And, And so what I'm telling you is that God is at work in this world calling people to himself from every tribe and language and people and nation and he does not need us, but he invites us as his children to go with him and to serve with him and to proclaim Jesus to the nations beginning right here where we are. Because salvation is only through faith in Jesus. So we know that we're sinners. And every one of us desperately needs the grace of God. 
We believe salvation is only through faith in Jesus. And when we embrace Jesus, then he forgives our sin. He removes our shame. He fills us with love. He gives us a purpose and changes our lives. So how do we live with all the unknowns, the what-if questions? Here's my response. In fact, this is the way I I choose to live every single day. Number one, trust God. Number two, rejoice in your salvation. And number three, share your hope with others. Trust God. Why would we not trust God? We're trusting God to forgive us of our sins and take us to heaven when we die. So why not trust God with the world that he created? Why not go ahead and give him the benefit of the doubt and do our best just to serve him? Rejoice in your salvation. Hey, guys, guess what? Every one of us deserves hell, and yet because of Jesus, we get heaven. That is worth throwing a party for every single day. Rejoice in your salvation. Let that that reality sink in and fill you with excitement and fill you with hope and realize that you are loved by God, and he's saying to us, neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. Live a changed life. And then finally, share your hope with others. Look, I should be honest. If you're concerned about people around the world who've never heard the gospel, then give to missions. Volunteer to go on a mission trip. That is an awesome way to to address that personally. But no matter who you are, if you know Jesus, there are people around you who don't know him. Share your hope. You don't have to be rude or nasty about it. Just share your hope through the love of Christ and the power of his word. So trust God. Rejoice in your salvation. Share your hope with others. It'll change your life if you live by that. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you that you have redeemed us. That you looked at our sin And you loved us anyway, and you sent Jesus to pay the price so that we could be your sons and daughters. For that, we say thank you. And God, today we simply want your reality to overwhelm our lives. Let us know your love, and let us know that you don't condemn us. In Jesus' name, amen.